I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the Scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. In the previous episodes of the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, we looked at the letter to the Hebrews. The title of that series of episodes was The Object of Faith and we discovered that the object of faith was, in fact, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Head knowledge will not get us very far as a believer, and just knowing about Jesus and confessing Him in faith means nothing unless there is some activity or work in that faith. That is why this series of episodes is titled, The Work of Faith. Compared to Hebrews, The letter of James is one of the easiest books of the Bible to understand, but at the same time, it will be one of the hardest to apply to our own lives. In normal Bible studies, we tend to overlook the little words and just underline the big and important sounding theological terms like justification and sanctification, but in James, the word do is the key word. Do is a very common word in the scriptures, but just as important. Just look at Jesus' short parable in Matthew's Gospel about the father who told his two sons to go and work in his vineyard. A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterwards he repented and went. And he went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, The first. Jesus said to them, Truly, I say to you, the tax collectors and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the harlots believed him, and even when you saw it, you did not afterwards repent and believe him. One son initially refused, but changed his mind and went to the vineyard. The other said yes, but never made good on his word. Jesus asked which of the two did the father's will, not which of the two said the right thing. So it is the doing that was important. This is the key concept of the letter of James that we need to keep in mind when we read it. James 1.22 sums it up quite beautifully. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. The New Testament is divided into various sections, each dealing with specific themes. I did cover this in more detail in a series of Bible studies called The Bible from the Beginning to the End. I will turn these studies into a podcast once I have completed the book of Revelation in this current series. I won't go into much detail now, except to say that after the first five books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, the remaining letters are divided into three sections, each with a different theme. Romans to Galatians, Ephesians to Philemon, and the last section, Hebrews through to Jude. The last section starts with the letter to the Hebrews, and this entire section focuses on the theme how to walk in faith. The whole substance of these letters of the New Testament is to explain to believers what faith is and how it works. Each letter makes a unique contribution to that theme. James is the second book in this section that deals with faith. Five people are called James in the New Testament. Perhaps the most well-known is James, the son of Zebedee, who was the brother of John, both of whom were disciples of Jesus. James was the first martyred apostle. He was beheaded by Herod in AD 44. The next James was the son of Alphaeus, another of the twelve disciples. He was known as James the Lesser, and is mentioned in Mark 15 verses 40. Then there is James the father of Judas Iscariot, the disciple who betrayed Jesus. Finally, there is James, the half-brother of Jesus. It was he that wrote this letter. James was one of the four half-brothers of Jesus. Both the Gospel of Mark and Matthew mention James, Joseph, Jude and Simon 
as the brothers of Jesus. So this letter is very unique and significant in that it was written by a man who knew more about the Lord Jesus than any other human being. James, the half-brother of Jesus, was raised in the same home in Nazareth with Mary and Joseph and grew up with Jesus. James was with his brothers Joseph, Simon and Jude when they opposed Jesus during the early days of his ministry, as mentioned in Mark 3 verses 31. James became a loyal follower of Jesus after his resurrection. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 8 that after the resurrection, the Lord appeared to James specifically. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers and sisters at the same time most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. I am sure many of us would like to know what happens during that time when James had regarded Jesus as nothing more than his brother during their life in the village of Nazareth. James was the one who had serious misgivings that Jesus was indeed the Son of God, as he had claimed. Mark 3 verses 21 records that Jesus' brothers thought he was out of his mind. John 7 verses 3 to 5 tells us that Jesus' brothers mocked him and didn't believe in him, and while these verses don't explicitly name James, it is quite possible that he was in these stories. However, finally after the resurrection, James was convinced that Jesus, his half-brother in nature, was indeed God manifest in the flesh, just like John 1 verses 14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. James saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So keep this in mind when we read the first verse of the letter that says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a marvelous testimony to the deity of Christ. Here is the man who was his natural half-brother, but James calls him our Lord Jesus Christ and refers to him as such throughout this letter. The book of James is probably the oldest book in the New Testament, written perhaps as early as AD 45, before the first council of Jerusalem in AD 50, which is described in Acts 15. At that time, there was a difference of opinion within the early church concerning the requirements for salvation. The issues centered on two questions. Do Gentiles first have to become Jews before they can become Christians? And do Gentiles have to observe the Mosaic law after they become Christians? After Peter had spoken of his ministry with the Gentiles, as recorded in Acts chapter 10, telling the council that the Holy Spirit that was given to uncircumcised Gentiles was precisely the same Holy Spirit that was given to the apostles and the Jewish believers on the day of Pentecost. James stood up and declared that, It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Acts 15 verses 19 after this council, a letter was sent out to the Gentile believers everywhere, which explained that the Gentiles should not have any burden from the law of Moses, and should only be sensitive to the reluctance of Jewish Christians when eating with them. This principle was very similar to the one that Paul mentioned in the letter to the Romans, chapter 14. Accept the one whose faith is weak, without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another, whose faith is weak, eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. 
Of course, it is true that the more mature we are in Christian faith, the fewer issues we will have about inconsequential matters. We need to be adaptable and sensitive to other people's consciences and not flaunt our own freedom to their detriment. As we mature in Christ, we will feel more and more free to enjoy the things that God has freely given us, but others might still feel awkward with certain practices, which are right in themselves, but might be a stumbling block because of the association with that person's past before they were born again. The classic example would be drinking wine at the meal with a former alcoholic. If you know that that person would struggle with this, it would be the loving thing to do to put aside your liberty for the sake of that Christian brother or sister's conscience. Acts 15 verses 23 speaks about the letter that James sent from the council in Jerusalem to the Gentile believers in Antioch and told those Gentiles how to conduct themselves with Jewish believers. The other letter that James wrote was to the Jewish believers, and this letter told them how to behave in the Gentile world. This is the letter of James that we are looking at. If you read this letter of James, you might see striking similarities to the teachings of Jesus. In fact, some theologians state that there are over 23 direct quotes from the Sermon on the Mount in the letter of James. It is therefore quite evident that the man James did listen to the messages of the Lord Jesus, and even if he struggled with them at the time, they had a significant impact on him later in his life. This letter is also filled with figures of speech taken from nature, more than any other letter in the New Testament, just like the teachings of the Lord Jesus himself. We read about the waves of the sea, plants, animals, trees and many others, all drawn from nature just as the Lord Jesus himself used to do. Let me start off by stating something that you might perceive as shocking. If you do not have faith, you won't receive anything from God. Hebrews 11 verses 6 says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith is therefore the channel through which all God's blessings come to us. So without faith, all that you can actually do is sin. Romans 14.23 says that everything that does not come from faith is sin. So, any activity that does not originate or is grounded in faith is a sinful activity. If you are not acting out of what you believe, then what you are doing is displeasing to God, even though you receive all the praise and honor from those around you. In this letter then, James is telling us several things about faith. Chapter 1 focuses on the answer to the question, what makes faith grow? I would like to remind you what I shared with you in the previous series of podcasts on the letter to the Hebrews. Jesus says, it does not take very much faith to start. In Matthew 17 verses 20, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move nothing will be impossible for you. So it is not quantity that is important in faith, it is quality. There are two things James tells us that makes faith grow. First is trials. Chapter 1 is full of practical counsel for those who are facing trials. James writes in James 1 verses 2 to 4, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So, we need trials. James does not leave us there. He explains how to handle trials. He tells us to accept them as from God, and if we lack wisdom about it, we must ask God to explain to us what is going on. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But we have to ask in faith. We have to expect Him to do this. And if we are poor, we must not let that bother us, because it is also a trial that can lead to blessing. And what is that blessing? Here in James 1 verses 12 is the answer. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because, having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. 
Have you ever thought how these early Christians faced trials compared to the way we do? The Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 11 verses 24 that five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. So, five times his hands were tied to a whipping post, and the Jews took a leather whip and beat him thirty-nine times across his back. In Galatians 6 verses 17, Paul confirms that I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. He was also stoned once. 2 Corinthians 11.25 What was Paul's attitude? What was the attitude of the Christians in those early days of the church through all these trials? They rejoiced and counted themselves fortunate to be considered worthy to suffer for the name of the Lord. The writer of Hebrews said they suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of their property because they knew that they themselves had better and lasting possessions. How do we react when we face trials? I have seen Christians unhappy and claiming that they were being persecuted just because they had to pay a speeding fine. Or that the fresh milk they bought yesterday at the shop was off when they opened it up the following day. We become disturbed over these little things. God sends us trials because we need them. That is what the scriptures declare. Trials teach us lessons which we could never learn otherwise, and if we did not have trials, we would be weak and incomplete Christians. Without trials, we would be unable to take the great responsibilities that will be placed on us in the day when we are with the Lord, when we enter into His kingdom, into the fullness of His service. The second thing that makes faith grow is the Word. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. James reminds us that it is the word of God expressed through our actions that makes our faith grow. Remember what the Apostle Paul taught in Romans 10 verses 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Nobody grows strong in faith by neglecting the reading of the Bible. How can we expect to know God's thoughts, His deep things, the underlying secrets of life unless we spend time with the book that reveals them all. There is no other source. So, in James chapter 1, we have learned that we can let our faith grow by rejoicing in trials and acting on the word. In chapters 2 and 3, James answers the question, how can faith be seen? How can we see that we have faith? Or that someone else has faith? James gives us three signs. Firstly, we cannot recognize faith if we show favoritism or prejudice. If we show favoritism because of the amount of money someone has in the bank, or we are prejudiced because of the color of a person's skin, then we have no faith. James 2 verses 1 to 8 says, My friends, if you have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, you won't treat someone better than others. Suppose a rich person wearing fancy clothes and a gold ring comes in one of your meetings, and suppose a poor person dressed in worn-out clothes also comes. You must not give the best seat to the one in fancy clothes and tell the one who is poor to stand at the side or sit on the floor. That is the same as saying that some people are better than others, and you would be acting like a crooked judge. My dear friends, pay attention. God has given a lot of faith to the poor people in this world. He has also promised them a share in his kingdom that he will give to everyone who loves him. You must treat the poor, but isn't it the rich who boss you around and drag you off to court? Aren't they the ones who make fun of our Lord? You will do all right if you obey the most important law in the scriptures. It is a law that commands us to love others as much as we love ourselves. Look at the way we regard well-known politicians today, or famous people, those that we have high regard for. 
We treat them differently to those poor beggars, those that society rejects. We shouldn't treat them differently, but we do. So prejudice cancels the command that Jesus our King gave us, to love your neighbor as yourself. We cannot manifest faith that way. So, if our faith is true, we will not manifest prejudice or favoritism. The second way faith is made visible is by actual deeds of mercy. James was very practical in his teaching regarding this. He says in James 2 verses 14 to 17, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say, Goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and well. But you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. If our faith does not lead us to share with our needy brethren, then there is something very wrong with it. I would go so far as to say that if we do not show mercy through our actions, we do not have faith at all. How can I say this? The faith of Jesus Christ, faith in Him, means that we actually have the Lord Jesus in us. Paul declares in Galatians 2 verses 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Would the Lord Jesus treat anybody who had a need in that way? Jesus, by his nature, would do anything in order to supply the lack and meet the need of that individual. Can Christian compassion, or charity as it is otherwise known, shut its hearts to the needs of those around us, either on an emotional or a physical level? So, if we want our faith to be seen and recognized, it must manifest itself in actual deeds. Read what Jesus himself said about that in Matthew 25 verses 41 to 46. I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you didn't welcome me. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't look after me. Do we ever use words of blessing as a cover-up for the coldness of our hearts? If we are honest with ourselves, we will admit that sometimes when we promise to pray for another's needs, we are speaking the wrong words. What God wants us to say is not, I will pray, but I will help. In episode 3 of Journey Through the Scriptures, we looked at the well-known chapter 11 of the letter to the Hebrews, known by many as the chapter about the heroes of faith. Do you remember that? In the next episode, we will deal with another well-known chapter in the Bible, the third chapter of James, the chapter of the tongue. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the journey through the Scriptures podcast, episode 5.